distance runners, etc. But you have another four ten miler on the same high school team on the national records four oh eight. Yes. And Coach Timmons, did he have a a plan? Did he have it or just to go out to practice day and say, Oh, we're gonna run say forty four quarters? Wait, okay, let me let me give you a little background. First of all, it was a senior, I was a senior in high school, and actually Coach Timmons had moved on, and then I had another coach by the name of J.D. Edmondson. And by the way, if you're looking for a weight loss program, he had me a senior year for one year. He lost 40 pounds. <laughs> he was so concerned about the fact he needed to do the right thing. He had some experience, but Coach Timmons had moved on to the University of Kansas. And along the way had come another young runner by the name of Mike Patterson. And so it wasn't so much Okay, it was the entire program. For example, you mentioned 40 times or 440. We did that. I'd never recommend that today. <laughs> you know, in fact, as you know, if you get them to do a quarter mile, I personally, I personally think quarter mile repeats are the ideal repeat for mile or half milers and two milers, 3,200 runners. And for this reason, it's short enough that you can run pretty fast, but you can recover and do it again and again and again. You just want to make sure you have the right amount of rest. And that's something we talk about with you know campers and Dr. Daniels explains all of that. But we didn't know that in those days. We're we're on the cutting edge of a lot of things. And so, you know, that would I would never recommend that, but that was one of the things that we did do. And it wasn't just me, it was the entire team. So now in terms of distance runners during the track season, we were full in terms of milers, half milers, uh, you know, but we didn't have a hundred guys on that particular part of the team, but we had a full team in terms of, you know, I was either one first, second, or third me. We had probably 15 guys waiting to move on to the track team. So it was an unusual period of time. Okay, that helpful? Yeah. Okay. And, and then, on the track, let me just say this because we were at downtown high school <coughs> and we were pretty evenly split. We had about 50% Caucasian, 50% blacks. And we got along just great. We didn't have it. There were tensions now. If I go back to this school, it's a rough school. But we decided we were going to work together and had a great time. Uh, workout week. Uh, my first year round, we ran once a day. And uh, when we got to the second year, Coach Simmons said, we're going to do something different this year. And I thought, wow, what is it? He said, we're going to start training twice a day. <laughs> That's a lot of extra work. So we got up in the morning. There weren't very many of us in the morning. I was one of them. And we started usually mostly a distance run in the morning of four or five miles, just getting in some distance and stretching. And by the way, my secret breakfast was this. You ready for this? I made a cold can. I made a warm can the night before. Campbell's tomato soup. Put it in a canister, and I had a good thick peanut butter sandwich with honey on it, and that was my breakfast. So that's the secret formula if you want to know what to make. <laughs> but that's what I'd have for breakfast in the morning. Now, we talked about that in terms of diet with the campers. It's important to make sure you eat right, and especially take right of food. Morning was four to five miles. Now, when I got into the college level, then sometimes I would do speed twice a day, but usually it was in the morning in terms of just the leg speed, 100 yard repeat. Uh, not all out, but 90%, trying to get your leg speed up because, frankly, if you don't run fast in practice, you're not going to run fast in competition. In fact, we felt like the workout didn't start until you got tired. And when you got tired, then you learn how to work through some of that and sprint through it. Now, it's important when you do all of that to watch the health of your athletes so the legs don't break down, so they don't break down up here, but it also helps change the paradigm. Back to high school, usually workouts, again, because we were a downtown school, uh, not as many coaches as we need. Usually it was Monday, Tuesday, or Thursday on the track. Sometimes Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, depending upon whether we had a Friday race or not. And the workouts many times were crews, what we call crews now, or tempo runs. Uh, they weren't all out, but that was essential in terms of building the base for what we were going to do. Now, we didn't understand that in those days. Looking back on it now, we do. In fact, I'll diverse slightly. Uh, anybody remember the name Peter Snell? Yeah, a run. Great exercise for science as well. But he, and I would do this as well, I did it in high school. I don't recommend this for high school runners. I'd go for 20 mile runs on Sunday. Now having said that, what we both recognized, though we didn't have the science for it, now it's there, that about an hour and a half is when you start developing, I see ahead if you're gym going, yes, you start to develop the kind of strength becomes the sprint at the end of your race. So don't jump into it immediately, but that was the kind of thing that I may have known. Peter was known for his great speed, and eventually I had that too. But it was that longer run on Sundays 
that really develop that kind of additional strength of the community. And again, you can sprint more to it. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, we'd have, usually the day before a race, okay, let me, let me do this. The, state, the idea behind competition was that we would train through early competitions. Meaning that by the time we got down to what we the city league, regional, and the state, we'd start resting for those meets. But prior to that, we would try and train through them, not exhausted, but from the standpoint of realizing that you've got to be able to see down the road. That's where you as a coach get to take that young mind up there and help them understand that resting for every race doesn't get them ready for the end of the season. And so he would walk us through that, and I had to have faith in this guy I'd never really known before, but he'd had a lot of success. In fact, in the seven years he was swimming cross-country and track coach, he won the state meet all three years except one year in swimming. <clears throat> it's the reason he lost. This is the reason he lost, because he'd always told the swimmers, number one, if you drink during the season, you're off the team. <coughs> so his juniors during the state meet went out and got plastered. <laughs> Coach Timmons had a meeting with him the Monday after the Saturday state meet. He said, guys, your career's over. That's the year, the next year he lost the state meet at the swimming because he wanted to understand that the coach had the principal and that wouldn't help you in terms of being down the road. <coughs> so he was a very strong disciplinarian. Uh, but anyway, those were some of the things that happened. Usually, <coughs> the day before was a little bit of a rest day, even when you were having resting for the end of the season. I mean, we wouldn't go all out, you just kind of go 50%, but you still do a workout. But most of it was on the track, half mile repeats, quarter mile repeats, 200s, all sorts of things like that. Now, one of the things that he would do, and the team would actually feel this was a part of it, so they weren't demeaned by what we were doing but later on as I started to get faster in my pursuit of four minutes. If we were running quarter mile repeats, the guys would start 10 seconds in front of me. <laughs> my goal was to sort of catch them as much as I could without overdoing it. And they understood it as kind of a game working towards the same goal of being the first high school or the first school to have a high school appointment on them. So they'd look at it as an opportunity to work together. You could do that kind of thing with your athletes if you prepare them for that and help them understand the process. It makes them better and helps the guy behind if you make them understand that it's not demeaning to do that sort of thing. Think about some of the better women runners. Marathon, all that sort of stuff. What do they do? They train for guys. So why not put something like that in practice in some of your schools where you have some of your runners who need that additional challenge? Be aware of what you're doing, but it's an opportunity to take them to that next level. <coughs> Average length of time is about an hour and a half, roughly one up, an hour and a half, and then warm down, and then you went to the pool. So sometimes it might stretch to two hours. But that was the standard we all expected the whole team was doing that. Uh, you mentioned cross training. We did a lot of it then. We wouldn't have called it cross training. Now I'd understand that it is. I mean, we would, okay, for example, if we're running quarter mile repeats or 200 repeats, our rest would be doing cables on the fence. There's no point. Yeah, you might not work your arms if you, you know, if, you, if you've been running, let's work your arms, make sure they're strong. And so, you know, different things like that to break up the monotony. In fact, Coach Timmons was ever the innovator. Let me share this one with you. How many of you have trouble with your athletes using their arms the right way? Most distance runners suffer. In fact, I we won't have time, but I can show you my early races where they were like this. It's a whole waste of motion. You've got to get going in the right direction. So Coach Timmons, one day he said, okay, guys, we're going to do a couple of iron cross quarter mile runs. What are those, Coach? Well, you're going to run a quarter mile if your arm's crossed. You know, when you finish, you start thinking, gee, I should use my arms the right way because that's a lot of wasted energy. <laughs> so he would look for creative things to instruct, and that was one of them. And I, you know, I appreciated that. Still took time to get the upper body strength. In fact, I'll show, I show this in camp, my very first high school race, all the way up to this race. And part of the explanation for having better upper body strength was doing weights afterwards, not necessarily heavy weights. We would often do, in those days, we didn't have the really nice weight machines. We'd go down to the local gas station, get various sized Hands, fill them full of concrete, stick an iron bar in there, and you have a 60 pound weight, a 30 pound weight. And that was the way we'd work out at the end of workout, or sometimes during the middle of the workout, we'd use those kinds of weights in the upper body. Again, just trying to build strength so that you could carry your arms the right way. I always felt, still do, and we emphasize this in camp, you run the last part of your race on your arms. Your legs don't necessarily feel like it, but you can force them by having that upper body strength. And that's why it's critical for distance runners to be lean but strong so that they can carry that last part of the race in a sprint to make sure they have the kind of race they're going to have. 